Good morning. Thank you for, for coming, it's, even if you are two. It's important for us, uh, for you to be here. Um, the, this session is about the presentation of a major project of ESOL called EPA Health. And uh, EPA Health is an epidemi epidemiological overview of the burden of liver disease across 35 European countries. The EU 28, Norway, Iceland, Switzerland, Serbia, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. And it assesses the burden of alcoholic liver disease, non-alcoholic liver disease, viral hepatitis, and liver cancer, and the main causes of each condition. Recommendation on how to reduce the burden of liver disease have also been included based on a review of effective prevention and treatment policies from around the world. The work was carried out by the United Kingdom Health Forum on a contract from ESO. The scientific lead of the project was Professor Nick Sharon, who is our speaker today, who was supported by an advisory panel of ESO liver specialists from Denmark, Bulgaria, Germany, Italy, Kazakhstan, Norway, Poland, Russia, and Serbia. Professor Sharon is here to present the findings of the HEPA Health. He's an academic clinical hepatologist at the University of Southampton and runs the liver unit at Southampton General Hospital. He's also actively involved in a clinical-based program of research in various aspects of alcohol-related problems. And together with uh, Ian Gilmore, president of the Royal College of Physicians, he co-founded the Alcohol Health Alliance UK an umbrella body bringing together 27 different organizations, including royal colleges, NGOs, and charities, with the aim of lobbying for evidence-based policies to reduce alcohol-related harm in the UK. For the past four years, he has been a, a panel member of the Lancet Liver Commission for England. He has published and spoken extensively on liver disease in major journal and conference around the world, and has been advisor of the European Commission and member state governments. A copy of the EPA Health publication is available on the table on your left. So thank you for coming and I give the word to Nick. Thanks very much. This is the, the reason that we started the HEPA Health Project. This is um, mortality rates from cirrhosis and chronic liver disease uh, across uh, a whole variety of uh, European countries and member states. And what we've done is we've, we've split these countries into four categories. Uh, so you can see the green countries here, Greece, Ireland, Netherlands, Norway, and Sweden. I've always had very low levels of liver mortality uh, from 1970 onwards. Uh, we've got another group, uh, the orange amber countries, Austria, France, Italy, Portugal, Spain, that used to have very, very high levels of liver mortality. And there have been very, very significant decreases in that liver mortality in all of those countries, mostly the Mediterranean countries. And that's to do with a change, essentially, in their drinking cultures. And then we have the, the red countries, which have got moderately high levels of liver mortality and have remained high. This is Belgium, Croatia, Denmark, Germany, Poland. Uh, and then we have a final group of countries where we have the opposite happening. Where in some cases, they've started at very low levels of liver mortality. At one stage, for example, the UK had the lowest levels of liver mortality in Europe. And they've gone up fivefold over the last uh, few decades. Uh, and these black countries also comprise the Eastern Mediterranean countries. So there's, just, there's two take home messages from this data. The first is that there's very marked differences between member states, and therefore huge potential to reduce liver mortality in those countries with high levels of, of, uh, of death rates. And also it shows that, that liver disease is malleable. It changes over time. So that we know there are things that we can do uh, to make these changes happen. 
So uh, in HEPA Health, it, con it consisted of three parts. Uh, the first part was uh, a review of data and systematic review of papers uh, to understand the picture of morbidity and mortality. Uh, the second part was uh, to un try and understand the mechanisms uh, for these individual uh, uh, etiologies of liver disease. And then the third part was to look at the evidence for the sorts of policies that can make a difference. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a very, very brief overview, and then if you've got any questions, we'd be very happy to try and answer them. This is just showing you the area covered. It's not just the EU, but it goes into uh, uh, Western Asia. And these are some of the organizations um, that we consulted uh, and that we referenced data from. Uh, I think we've already done that slide. Massimo's told you a little bit about the structure. So we had a focus group uh, uh, of committee members who reviewed all aspects of the report. Uh, we did some semi-structured qualitative interviews and we also did an online survey uh, of ESL members. Uh, this is just showing you the breakdown in terms of the etiology uh, of liver-related deaths. You see that we're talking between 200 and 300,000 deaths in total across the region. Uh, the grey sector is primary liver cancer. Then the green sector is alcohol. The beige sector is really important because these are liver disease where we know the patient's died of liver disease, but we don't know the etiology. It's not been recorded on the death certificate. And this is a very significant component of liver death still in some countries. And it changes markedly. So, for example, the Scandinavian countries, they have a very low proportion of deaths where the etiology is not recorded. Uh, in Italy, there's a very high proportion, up to 80% of deaths are of unknown etiology. And then we've got um, viral hepatitis, Fatty liver disease. Fatty liver disease, you see, it appears, it really hardly, hardly appears at all in the mortality data. And yet, in terms of the patients that we're seeing in clinics, uh, up to 50% now have fatty liver disease. And this is another uh, important public health aspect of, of liver disease, which is increasing. And then we have autoimmune metabolic and miscellaneous causes. This is just making the point that patients with liver disease um, die at a relatively young age. If you walk around the wards of my hospital, you'll see most of the wards are full of people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. In the liver wards, we've got people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. And the peak age of death is actually late 40s, early 50s. And that means that liver disease is punching way above its weight in terms of uh, premature years of life loss. This is years of working life loss. And we see that alcohol now becomes a, a, really a very, very important factor uh, and cancer less important. And this is just an illustration of what's been happening in the UK, which is one of those countries where we've seen a marked increase in liver mortality. Uh, and in fact, the likelihood is within the next few years that liver disease will become the single leading cause of years of working life lost. And that's because the previous most important causes, which are ischemic heart disease, breast cancer, and lung cancer, have all been falling dramatically, largely as a result of effective tobacco policy. And there's a message there for liver disease. This is just giving you some examples of two contrasting trends uh, in, in uh, cirrhosis mortality. On the one side, we have France, where we've seen a threefold reduction in liver mortality, and that is almost all due to a reduction in alcohol consumption. And interestingly, what's happened in France is that that reduction in consumption has been a re reduction in the consumption of cheap wine. Uh, and uh, consumption of quality wine, wine in bottles with corks, has gone up. And so what's happened in France is that you've seen this dramatic reduction in liver mortality, you've seen a reduction in overall alcohol consumption, but the value of the French wine industry has increased. So this is a win-win scenario for France. And then on top of that, you've also had very effective public health measures over the last, particularly over the last 10 or 15 years, and a landmark regulation in alcohol marketing with a loi of vin. It was a very successful uh, piece of legislation. Uh, 
In the UK, you've seen the exact opposite. You've seen uh, a deregulation of, of the alcohol industry. And the interesting thing is that although you've seen this enormous increase in, our, in, in liver mortality, it has, it's, not, it's not due to a, a, a huge increase in alcohol consumption overall. Uh, what's changed uh, in the UK is actually a change in the marketplace, whereas 30 years ago, people were drinking relatively weak beer in pubs. 70% of alcohol was bought and sold in pubs. Now, people are buying much cheaper alcohol in supermarkets, they're drinking it at home. Big increase in wine drinking, big increase in spirits drinking, a reduction in beer consumption. We've seen this increase in liver mortality, which is because people are drinking cheaper, stronger alcohol. This is uh, some historical data, and this is, again, show, shows you a really important factor, which is how rapidly liver mortality can change in response to environmental measures. So this is a classic paper from Terrace in the 1960s, and this shows you uh, the, 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 the data there from Paris is the outbreak of the First World War and the Second World War when they had wine rationing. We've got data from the States, from Prohibition, followed by the First World War, and then from England and Wales. <clears throat> and then on the other side, we've got here consumption of wine and spirits in England and Wales. And the interesting thing is it takes a minimum of 10 years to develop cirrhosis, sometimes longer. So these are people who are drink, drinking too much over a long period of time, but then when overall population alcohol consumption is, is, is curtailed as a result of environmental factors, the response in terms of liver mortality is almost immediate, which if you think about it is quite paradoxical. It doesn't make sense. But there is a very solid clinical reason for that, and the reason is that people come into hospital with alcoholic liver disease with acute on chronic liver failure as a result of their recent drinking. And as soon as they stop drinking, their projected survival starts to increase. So, so the acute on chronic liver failure is an acute thing. It's related to recent drinking. As soon as you stop that, then you start to see immediate improvements in mortality. And we saw exactly the same thing uh, in Russia in, in, when Gorbachev did his alcohol reforms in the mid-1980s. Uh, you saw dramatic reductions in mortality from all sorts of alcohol-related causes, but specifically fr from, from liver disease. And then when Yeltsin came in five years later and reversed those reforms, then all of those people who didn't die then died over the next five years. And we saw the same thing in Canada when, when uh, the minimum unit price of alcohol was increased by 10%. You saw a 30% reduction in directly attributable mortality, and you saw that within a year. So effective public health measures actually impact within the, uh, you know, the term of a single government, within a year or, or so at the most. In terms of what works, uh, there's a whole variety uh, of policies with, with evidence behind them as far as alcohol is concerned. I'm not going to read the list. Uh, they're in the document that, uh, and you can read for yourselves. What I would say is that one policy stands head and shoulders above the rest in terms of its evidence base, and that is, and that is controlling the price of alcohol. Um, the, 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 the risk curve for cirrhosis is, is unusual in terms of alcohol. In terms of, the, in terms of the health risks of alcohol, most of the health risks, the other health risks of cancer of the GI tract, uh, breast cancer and hypertension, they're linear, they're a straight line risk and they go from zero. For liver disease it's quite different, it's an exponential curve. So it starts off relatively fat and then steepens sharply. And what that means is that in terms of liver mortality, it's heavily weighted towards very heavy drinkers. The average consumption of alcohol of patients with cirrhosis on my wards is 150 units a week. That's 15 bottles of wine a week. Okay, that's the mean. The median is 120 units or 12 bottles of wine a week. In other words, half of my patients are drinking more than the equivalent of 12 bottles of wine a week. That means that they're not drinking Chateau Lafitte, they're drinking the cheapest alcohol they can get their hands on. And if you do something which tackles that cheap alcohol, then that is a highly effective health measure. The second most effective measure is the control of marketing. And, and there, are, there are similarities here with tobacco, because that's exactly the same as we see uh, with tobacco control. 
As far as obesity is concerned, for alcohol, we've had thousands of years uh, to understand what works in terms of alcohol, in terms of cultural changes, in terms of natural experiments uh, in different countries over the years. Obesity is a much more recent phenomenon, and we don't have the same weight of evidence. Um, but again, the evidence is emerging, and interestingly, the same evidence is now starting to emerge in terms of fiscal policy and in terms of marketing regulation. The final big risk factor is viral hepatitis. And this really is a, is a huge success story. Uh, when I started as a liver doctor 20 years ago, uh, there were no effective treatments for viral hepatitis. Now we have highly effective treatment for hepatitis B and C with, with nearly 100% cure rates for both hepatitis B and C. And so the challenge uh, for viral hepatitis uh, is, is to try and get treatment accessed, particularly in those countries where uh, uh, it's more difficult for patients to access treatment. And there's a bunch of other things which work, and of course vaccination is now universal for hepatitis B, uh, and we desperately need a vaccine for hepatitis C. I'd just like to point out the synergies between these different health factors. And you'll see that I've put tobacco on there. Tobacco is not a cause of liver disease, and it will become apparent why I've put it up there in a second. So, for example, between alcohol and obesity, if your BMI is more than 35, then the toxicity of alcohol doubles. So four bottles of wine effectively becomes eight bottles of wine. Uh, and, and again, in Europe, we have a, quite a large section of the population, a section of the population which is increasing, who are drinking a bit too much and are a bit overweight, and then they get a double hit on their liver. There's also a synergy between alcohol and viral hepatitis. Uh, if you're drinking two, the average equivalent of two bottles of wine, then it increases your mortality from hepatitis C by more than twofold. And actually, if you look at the uh, attributable fraction for alcohol in people with hepatitis C, it's between a third and a half. In other words, Half of people dying from hepatitis C are dying because of their alcohol consumption. And now that we've got essentially 100% cure rates for hepatitis C, people are having to look back now at those other factors, uh, these behavioral synergies, because people who drink too much uh, often eat too much and often smoke as well. And so they're, so they're really increasing their cancer risk. Uh, and it's not just clinical synergies between these health factors. There are also policy synergies, and this is... My last slide now, and this is, these are the best buys from the World Health Organization. You can see we've got tobacco, alcohol, and obesity up there. And number one policy in terms of effectiveness and cost effectiveness is to tackle cheap alcohol, cheap tobacco through taxation and through more inventive policies for alcohol. So the new kid on the block in policy terms is minimum unit price. So you set a threshold price, you can't sell in the, in the UK, in Scotland, it's going to be 50p. You're not going to be able to sell a unit of alcohol below 50p. And the importance of this policy is that it only tackles cheap alcohol. It does not increase the price of alcohol in bars and pubs where it's already uh, high enough. Uh, the second most effective marketing bans, both for tobacco and alcohol. Uh, and then we've got place, place of sale. These are the four P's of marketing. Smoke-free places in terms of tobacco and restrictions in availability as far as alcohol is concerned. Those are the top three uh, uh, things. And then also we've got um, products and health information. So uh, I'm going to stop there and take any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nick. Excellent. Um, you want to sit here or? I'll start. Yeah. Um, I would like to remind that there is a document with, I think, including most of the illustration uh, on the table on the left uh, before you go. So the discussion is open. Please. Just a second, we have a. Um, this is Ed Sussman with uh, MedPage today. Um, is there a 
problem with cheap wine per se different than more expensive wine? Or is it just that if you have cheap wine, you're going to drink more of it? Yeah, there's, it, it, the, the toxic content of wine is the alcohol. Uh, there's nothing in there, and there's nothing else in there that's damaging people. So it's purely the fact that if it's very, very cheap, you can drink an awful lot of it. Um, and, I mean, the interesting thing in France is that uh, wine is still very cheap. That, that decrease in mortality that we've seen is not as a result of, of fiscal measures. Uh, there's still no, no, no duty on wine in any of these Mediterranean countries, in fact. Um, and I think what's happened is that there's been a gradual decrease in mortality since the 1960s, and it was only really in the 1960s that evidence linking alcohol to health concerns really became uh, widespread and understood. Um, up until then, alcohol was thought to be a health component, you know, a healthy component of your diet. And I think it, in the 1960s, the mortality rate for liver disease in France was 50 per 100,000. At the same time in the UK, it was 2 per 100,000. Absolutely colossal difference to the extent that pretty much everybody in France had a friend or relative with a drink problem and, and, and probably with liver disease. And, and I think an important component of that change in drinking culture was the increased awareness of the health consequences of drinking to excess. And there are also uh, important cultural changes. So urbanization, the death of the long lunch, the lunch in, in France and Spain. Uh, to the extent now if you see people drinking in a restaurant in, in France, the likelihood is they'll have a half bottle of wine or just water. They won't be drinking large flagons of uh, very, very cheap plonk at, at home. Why do you think that uh, uh, Italy has seen no uh, difference overall in their uh, policy? Uh, for lack of that? Well, the, the, there are very different drinking patterns across Europe, and the interesting thing is how long those have persisted. So uh, you can actually go back to uh, ancient Greece and Rome where the Mediterranean drinking pattern was one of, first of all, wine was watered down with water, so it was a third wine, two-thirds water. It was completely unacceptable to be drunk in ancient Rome and ancient Greece other than at a Bacchanalian festival where you had a sort of pass out. And if you contrast that with the sort of northern... Scandinavian, Western, Celtic patterns of drinking where alcohol use was essentially something to celebrate battles won or lost in some cases and was a sort of, was feast drinking. Uh, and the idea of drinking to be completely drunk was glorified within those cultures. And actually we still have elements of that attitude towards alcohol in Europe today. So, if, for example, if you look at the Eurobarometer data that was published some years ago showing the proportions of alcohol which is drunk with meals, those Mediterranean wine drinking countries, nearly all of the alcohol is drunk with meals. It's unusual to drink alcohol on its own. Whereas if you look at the northern, western Celtic fringe, most alcohol is drunk as, without meals. It's drunk in order to get drunk. Those northern Scandinavian countries with very low levels of liver mortality have always had very restrictive alcohol policies. I remember once looking up the data on people being arrested for being drunk and disorderly in Bordeaux and Copenhagen in the 1930s when they actually had alcohol prohibition in Copenhagen and there were still more than 10 times as many people being arrested for drunk and disorderly as in Bordeaux. Um, so there's sort of cultural changes that have been there for hundreds of, hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, and persist to this day. So we still have very restrictive policies to control alcohol consumption, and that's, that's reduced liver mortality to very low levels. Um, what's very interesting are the countries where you've seen these big changes the other way, and the two prime examples are the UK and Finland. Um, now, in Finland, what, what, what's happened is that they had pretty low levels of liver mortality up until when they joined the EU and border controls were relaxed and suddenly you had flood of, uh, of cheap alcohol coming in from Estonia. You saw a massive increase in liver mortality over a very few years. It doubled. And then you had a raft of alcohol control policies introduced, uh, 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 changes in taxation, and that increase in, in liver mortality then leveled off and has started to decrease. 
The UK is the prime example of how not to do alcohol policy. Um, uh, as I said, in the 1960s, our mortality rate was 2 per 100,000. France was 50. We overtook France, Spain, and Italy several years ago. Our mortality rate is now about 17. And it's still going up. It's going up by about 9% per year. And that is directly related to the fact that, first of all, we've had this change in the drinking marketplace, people drinking stronger alcohol. But the reason they're drinking stronger alcohol is of successive uh, 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 relative reductions in alcohol duty, particularly on those stronger alcohols. And you can actually map uh, the affordability of alcohol to those changes in liver mortality. There was a very interesting natural experiment a few years ago, because in 2008, there was a massive duty, well, massive 6% duty increase, followed by a 2% duty escalator for the next few years. And suddenly what we saw was a 9% increase in liver mortality year on year suddenly stopped, and it flattened out overnight, mm -hmm. and it started to go down. And in 2013, those fiscal policies were reversed, and there were tax cuts to alcohol. And immediately, within a year, we saw liver mortality start to increase again. <clears throat> So really just the most perfect example of a natural experiment illustrating just how malleable liver mortality is to relatively small changes in fiscal policy. You know, these, these duty increases were not noticed by the general population at all. The only people really who noticed were the, were the drinks industry, but they were highly effective. It seems improbable that governments would, take, would, would reduce their uh, excise taxes by Yeah, that's a, that, that, I mean, that's a very uh, uh, interesting question. First of all, in terms of the impact of alcohol on uh, the wider economy is very significant. So um, uh, uh, the uh, WHO and OECD data, there was an OECD report last year, suggests that up to 2.6% of GDP is lost as a result of alcohol misuse. Now, some of that is in health costs, some of it is in crime costs, but actually the biggest proportion is in productivity losses. And that's as a result of absenteeism, from people who are drunk, and presenteeism. So that's people turning up for work on a Monday morning, too hungover to work properly. So it's a very, very big component, and, 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 uh, uh, and so that's an important factor. If you, if you look at the UK example, um, those relative tax cuts since 2013 have cost more than four billion pounds. And that's basically a giveaway to the drinks industry. And uh, the drinks industry lobbied for those tax cuts on the basis of the, uh, the impact of the drinks industry on the economy in terms of jobs and production and all the rest. But, but interestingly, none of those submissions contained any information about the downside. Um, but I think it just illustrates how powerful the, the drinks industry lobby is, you know, how influential uh, on government and how difficult it is to get uh, uh, politicians to look at these wider uh, health aspects. Having said that, um, again, if you look within the UK, there are marked differences. So Scotland, uh, very, very good alcohol strategy was passed in 2012. It's been held up by a challenge from the drinks industry in the Scottish courts and then Luxembourg and then the UK Supreme Court. It's now passed and will be implemented in May. And what we were going to see in Scotland is a dramatic reduction in liver mortality within a year or so. And the same sort of strategy is being used in Ireland and also in Wales. And the likelihood is that is going to get picked up by other member states. Uh, and those, you know, those natural experiments are going to be very interesting over the next few years, particularly as we're going to see a divergence um, above and below the Scottish border, as it were. Any question? At the moment, the, the mortality caused by the NASH is quite low compared to alcohol. Uh, do you have any projection uh, what it should be, it could be in the future? 
Yeah, I, th I think the likelihood is that obesity is probably going to become the leading cause of liver disease uh, in many European countries uh, at some stage in the future. Uh, and that's going to be partly because of a synergy with alcohol. Um, but, but obesity rate, rate, rates are increasing now. In terms of in terms of liver disease, obesity and alcohol are really very, very similar. If you look at a liver biopsy from somebody who's got a very high BMI or is drinking too much, uh, then you see the same pathology. They First of all, they develop fat within the hepatocytes within the liver. And then as a result of that fat within the liver, you get a process of fibrosis, inflammation to some extent, but mostly fibrosis. Now, there's a genetic link to that in that only about 20 or 30% of the population have the genetic susceptibility, which means that they're going to get significant liver disease as a result of that fat. And interestingly, that works for alcohol as well. So if you take 100 people with, with alcohol dependency, then only 20 or 30 of them are going to have significant liver disease at any stage. The rest essentially are immune. It's not something we shout about from the rooftops for obvious reasons. Um, the, what's different is the time scale. So you might develop cirrhosis from, from alcohol over a 10-year period, um, with obesity, the same process happens, but it might happen over 40, 50, or 60 years. And so what we're seeing now, instead of waves of young people and middle-aged people coming in with alcohol-related cirrhosis in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, we're increasingly seeing people coming in with end-stage liver disease in their 60s and 70s as a result of obesity and type 2 diabetes. It's part of the metabolic syndrome. And very often, by the time they've got advanced liver disease, they're no longer overweight, and it's not absolutely clear uh, what the etiology of their liver disease is. And the other really important factor, which is becoming increasingly uh, uh, prevalent, is, is a direct link between uh, obesity and obesity-related liver disease and primary liver cancer. And we're now seeing patients developing primary liver cancer who aren't necessarily cirrhotic first. It appears to be a sort of separate stream. Massimo, have you got, would you like to make a comment about that at all? Well, I know this uh, is, you know, what you're saying is uh, excellent, is what we see, you know, on everyday practice. And um, especially the synergy between alcohol and, and metabolic factor. Most patients coming with cirrhosis, they don't drink or they cannot be labeled as alcoholic, especially in countries, you know, in Northern Europe, because it sounds like a normal alcohol intake. And they don't have type 2 diabetes. They had only overweight they are not even obese. So this uh, synergy is very subtle. You know, it's not something that you need to have very clear lab label to, to have in place. And this is actually most of the patient. It's actually the, the large majority of patients that don't have a clear you know, uh, label of you know, potentially developing liver disease. Um, now, one, thing, one comment I want to make is obviously all this becomes more and more frequent with time. So it's clear that the incidence is becoming you know, higher you know, in the fifth, sixth, and seventh decade of life. But what we see increasingly is patients you know, in the 20s coming with cirrhosis, and they clearly have a metabolic issue. So that when, when they're adolescent, they have a potentially non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is not really har you know, harmful because you know, there is no other additional factor. But as soon as they become legal age for drinking and they start either drinking every day, but most likely they go binge drinking on the weekend, which is a, is a European trend. And all, even in Southern Europe, there is a binge drinking. So as you said before, in, in, a, you know, in my culture, I'm Italian, going to a party and, and get drunk, you know, you will never be invited again. You know, my wife is Danish. You know, if you go to Denmark, you don't get drunk. You know, you, the people look at you, he's strange. So, but this is changing. You know, now the culture of going to a party and get co completely stoned in the first hour is all over Europe. It's a, one of the negative things of European global, uh, uh, Europeanization of, of the continent. Um, <clears throat> so, um, do you think that there is little attention on youth, you know, and, you know, this transition between uh, adolescent with a metabolic liver and binge drinking? What do you think about this? Because, you see, in the country where there is, you know, increasing incidence of death due to alcohol, 
what is the division between uh, different group, age groups? I, th I, th I think in terms of the younger people that we're seeing, as far as alcohol concerned, it, it is still the very, very heavy drinkers. And when you're looking at, at, at the incidence of alcohol dependency, it's quite interesting. So, as, you know, the earliest you look, you're still going to find a small proportion, 2 or 3% of the population who are drinking at very high levels, even in their early 20s, late 20s, mid 20s. But you're absolutely correct. I think there's this, there's this group in Europe, which, which interestingly, I don't think exists to the same extent in the States. You, you, in the States, you, you know, you, you're either a very heavy drinker or you tend not to drink at all. You don't have this group of people who are drinking a little bit too much in America. And so, and so you have this concentration on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which I think is a, is a poor description of the situation that we have in the UK where we, we have a combination, a synergistic combination uh, of a, a, a large proportion of the population 20, 30, 40% of the population being overweight and drinking as well. And, you know, th this data simply isn't out there at the moment. These, this is an iceberg which we're waiting to hit. Um, and, and at some stage, it's, it's, it really is going to impact on health services. And we just see, I think we're just seeing the very beginning of it now. And if you look at individual country data, even though um, obesity is a relatively small cause of mortality, you are seeing very significant increases within that group. Um, and, uh, and there's a big recording issue as well, because as again, as I said, by the time they, they, they come to their demise from liver disease, often it's not in, uh, uh, clear what the etiology uh, factors some years before were. I have another question because it is um, tobacco policy has been very, very, very effective. So there is de definitely a decrease in people smoking tobacco. Um, they, you know, at, somehow, you know, the the system has been able to uh, to make tobacco smoker guilty, you know, or you know, feeling like they, they, they need to be in a ghetto, they need to go to smoke in a corner. And, and this has a very, very strong uh, psychological impact. I think many people stop smoking because they don't want to be uh, second or third class citizen. Um, it looks like that alcohol, because extreme alcoholism is a, a very small niche. Most people drink, you know, as a normal social behavior, you know, it would be impossible to, to go in, into Mediterranean countries, France or Italy or Spain, without having wine on the table, even at lunch. I mean, it's, uh, and so it would be impossible to, to remove alcohol from, uh, e even increasing the price, people will buy things that, that is cheaper. Uh, something that I see in the UK that is without control is beer. Now, beer has clearly a low, low uh, alcohol uh, con content, but the volume, so the average uh, person going to the pub drinks three pints, okay? Three pints is like six units or more, maybe between six and eight units, which is basically half of the alcohol you can drink in a week. And uh, how can we reduce that? If you increase the, 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 the price of a pint of beer, do you think it's going to uh, it's going to have an impact. Maybe they drink two pints instead of three, but... I mean, I think it's undoubtedly true that the messaging is very different from tobacco. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, tobacco essentially is about relieving an addiction. You know, no one has ever enjoyed their first cigarette. It's not, you know, it's not an enjoyable thing. People smoke because they want another cigarette because, because essentially they're suffering from nicotine deprivation. Um, and that's very different from the situation with alcohol where... You know, we have to factor in the fact that, you know, a, a lot of people really enjoy uh, a drink. They enjoy a glass of wine or, or a glass of beer. And so, and so really the messaging uh, has to be to look at the evidence. And what the evidence shows is it's all about this exponential risk curve, you know. If you're talking about reducing liver disease mortality, then you really can concentrate on those extreme drinkers. In the UK, it's 1.3% of the population drink on average more than seven bottles of wine a week. Um, now, they, they comprise more than half of the liver mortality. Um, they drink 14% of all the alcohol, you know, a colossal proportion. 
Incidentally, there's something called the Pareto Principle, which is the 80-20 rule, which applies to pretty much all products, crisps, lawnmowers, you name it. And that shows that, that as, a, as an alt marketing principle, the 20% of the population who are the heaviest consumers will consume 80% of the value of that product. And so for alcohol, that works out that 75% um, that of the population drink within recommended guidelines. They only drink about 25% of the alcohol. The majority of the alcohol consumed is actually consumed by harmful and, and hazardous drinkers. And harmful drinkers, those drinkers who are drinking more than twice the recommended limit, more than 35 or 50 units of alcohol in the UK, drink a third of all the booze. And so the market is distorted towards these very heavy drinkers. And I think the message has to be, you know, that, that you know, we're at a scientific meeting here. We're going to be watching scientific papers presented on all sorts of different topics. And people don't realize that there is as much science behind alcohol policy and evidence behind alcohol and health policy as there is behind any of these biochemical and basic scientific uh, uh, diseases, uh, disease mechanisms. Um, and you just have to look at the data, and that's what the World Health Organization have done. It's what the OEC have, have done. You know, you look at the evidence, and the evidence shows that actually what works for tobacco also works for alcohol and will almost certainly work for obesity. Uh, and they're not, we don't need big changes. You know, it's a little bit like, you know, how can an economy be dramatically affected by a 0.5% change in interest rates? It sort of doesn't make sense, but that's the way it works. That's what happens. And so in the same way, a 2% increase in duty can have a very significant effect on a trend in liver mortality such that it will turn an increasing trend into a reducing trend. And it's about trying to make the arguments for these really simple and straightforward things that we can do. And the other thing to bear in mind is that liver disease is expensive. The, the lifetime cost of a patient with alcohol-related cirrhosis in the UK is between 50 uh, and 120,000 pounds, which is pretty much the same in euros these days <laughs> since Brexit. Um, you know, that's expensive. Now, uh, looking after people when they get to hospital isn't a very effective thing to do. Mortality rates for liver disease admissions haven't really improved for the last 30 or 40 years in terms of overall survivals. In hospital, mortality has improved, but the overall survival of our patients has, hasn't hardly changed at all. Now, very simple things like better, better regulation of exposure of young people to alcohol marketing, small increases in taxation, they're not only cheap, they bring in revenue to the government, as we saw, you know, four billion pounds giveaway. That's, that's, you know, that's more than the hole in the health service budget. Um, so, you know, there's, there's all sorts of really sensible reasons why governments should be looking at these measures. Um, but the, I guess the difference is, you know, most diseases don't have uh, a highly funded, if you like, advocate. You know, there's a trillions and trillions of dollars and euros go, go into to, uh, our alcohol industry. They spend 10% of their budget on marketing. They're very, very powerful players, uh, and it's about countering uh, those arguments. Any other questions? Any more questions? Okay, so um, we can conclude. Thank you for coming. We hope to have this um, presentation broadcast on the ESO website. So if you want to go back to some of the presentation and uh, please uh, help yourself with the book, you know, which is uh, on the left side. Thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Bye.